it's not a new ministry really it's it's an addition to an existing ministry it's, well, I really am the Minister for Economic Development but if you look at what is published there's a list of things like inward investment that of course if you know if each of those items were to be put as what I'm the minister of, it would be a very long read before you got to the end of it. So this is just something that fits in, in a way, with my role as Minister for Inward Investment and Minister for Economic Development, because economic development and inward investment are things that create activity which normally yields revenue for the government. So the stability element is something that uh, we are not experiencing for the first time in the 48 years I've been because of the disruption to government revenues and the impact on government spending. So Joe, you say Gibraltar is not experiencing financial stability for the first time in 48 years. What's your definition of financial stability? Well, frankly, it's a very simple thing because uh, 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 Stability in terms of public finance, which is something separate from the economy, is that you are able to pay for the things that you need to do from the revenue that you're collecting. So you are, you know, you're, the money that is coming in covers the money that is going out. What has happened is that there have been two very big impacts, disruptive impacts, disruptive impacts, both of which have the effect of reducing the money that comes in and increasing the money that goes out. And therefore, that is not a stable situation because it can only last so long before you're in real, real trouble. I mean, this is an extremely serious situation that we're facing and I don't want to um, underestimate it or uh, minimize just how serious it is. Uh, it will not be an easy thing to deliver. Gibraltar's response to the COVID emergency was £110 million as of last December, and that included the loss of government revenue. We've also lost some key economic drivers, such as tourism and bunkering has been greatly reduced. What are your priorities going forward? Well, uh, this is a, a moving target. I mean, you, you see, the, the, it's quite obvious. I mean, if, if we've got a situation where... Um, instead of people paying social insurance, we are giving them money to pay their employees, and on top of that, not collecting social insurance is a double whammy, you see? So how quickly can that be altered? Not quickly. This is not something that will be over in one year. But how can it be altered? What, what are your key well, priorities? Uh, look, it's very simple. This is simple arithmetic. If you haven't got enough money to meet what you're spending, you have to find ways of creating extra money coming in or ways of reducing the amount of money going out. This is, there is no big secret or magic formula about this. This is like any household which has got a source of income or any business. I mean, the government is in the position of the guy in Main Street who suddenly finds that he's got additional costs because of COVID and less customers because of COVID. It does sound as though you're talking about cuts in the public sector. You've talked about the public sector being unsustainable in its size. It, will there be cuts? I have been giving warnings, health warnings of COVID, for a number of years. The difference between unsustainability and where we are now. Uh, last year, I said we have now gone a stage Further, we've now gone uh, to the next step in the deterioration of our financial stability by moving from something that is not sustainable to something that is not affordable. What is the difference? Well, I will tell you what the difference is. We had for many years around 30 million pounds a year increase in spending. The cost of running the public service, the health service, the education service, everything that, that, that the public service require more resources and more manpower to do in order to deliver sometimes improvements, sometimes greater coverage, sometimes, you know, if we decide to give 
people the opportunity of studying for a second degree after the first one that costs more money. So every improvement produces a, an effect on spending which results in 30 million a year. And I will say, well, look, 30 million a year may be something we can afford today, but we will not be able to afford indefinitely going into the future 30 million year after year after year. The point will come when we will not be able to increase by 30 years. We reach that point as a result of Brexit where we got to the point where we could not, no longer pay for further increases and we are no longer now able to pay for the increases that have taken place in the last 24 months. So it's inevitable then that you will be revisiting some of those uh, increases and there will be a reduction in some well, areas of public service. Some, there, will be, there, will be, there will be hard decisions to be taken uh, to close that gap. If we cannot close the gap, uh, I think it, we will not be able to close it overnight. I think this is going to be a, a, a very tough job. You know? But the first step has got to do, we have to do, is to analyze how we're working, how we're doing. And in fact, I had already identified that even before the pandemic by saying during the election campaign, in my last political broadcast, in speeches that I've made to parliament, that the future shape of the economy had to be that we increased efficiency so that we created more wealth by working better, which is not necessarily working harder. Working better means working more productively, rather than by depending on an economy with ever bigger inputs of labor from across the border. Why is that? Because if there is a big gap between average earnings, because there's a lot of low paid jobs in the private sector, and you create a revenue stream from the government, from the number of workers you have, well look, uh, to give you a picture, this is not an accurate uh, analysis of the, of the nature of the gap, but to give you a picture, it would mean that in year one you need, for example, three workers in the private sector to provide the income for what one worker in the public sector is engaged in delivering. But if the gap increases, then you have to then go to four workers for one, and then five for one, and the six for one. Well, look, it doesn't take a genius to work out that that cannot go on indefinitely, because then we would need eventually, theoretically, hypothetically, we would need to import the whole of Andalusia to keep the system going. So, Joe, you've talked about reducing public expenditure. What would be at the top of the list to be cut? For example, the music festival. Would we expect to see another music festival anytime soon? Well, we've not had it for two years, and I think it will be a long time before it comes back. I mean, uh, the gap between the revenue it, it yielded and the cost of doing it was three million pounds for two days. Uh, we are in no position to be asking people to accept changes uh, which will impact on their lives and, and spend that kind of money, in my view. I mean, remember that uh, it's not that I have the sole say in this. I, I am going to be primarily the guy that is giving the advice to the Chief Minister and the Cabinet for collective decisions to be taken as to what has to be done on the basis that, by definition, I've got more experience than anybody else on the team because I've been there longer than anybody else. In terms of Brexit, your national economic plan was based on a no-deal scenario. So how has that been affected by the fact that there could possibly be a treaty with Gibraltar entering the Schengen area? Look, the, uh, the position in the Schengen area is about movement of people. It's not about employment, investment, economic activity or anything else. Clearly, movement of people means visitors who spend money as well as uh, people who come into work. The, the people who come into work are 14 to 15,000 a day. That is a big chunk of the movement across the border. But even if there is fluidity in the uh, border situation 
after the end of the six months, if we if we finally agree the terms that are acceptable, we may, which may not happen, you know. Remember, this is what we've got at the moment is a framework of the kind of deal that is going to emerge. But it's only when you start putting the thing down in detail that you know whether there are things that you can accept or not. But if we finally come up with something that creates fluidity, it doesn't alter the economic structure. And the economic structure that the National Economic Plan was designed for was a structure which was not frontier dependent. It was, in fact, to make us uh, immune to frontier problems. That is what it was designed for. So therefore, the plan is one that if there is no fluidity, well, then it's there for that purpose. And if there is fluidity, then well, fine. It won't be made uh, uh, redundant because there is fluidity. But fluidity means that people can get across the frontier between us and Spain faster and therefore more people can cross in a given period of time. That is fundamentally what it's all about. So Joe, can you just give us an update on the joint venture with the Chinese company building the new residential home for the elderly? Is that still going ahead? It's going ahead, but you see, one of the things that um, has hampered the delivery of it, uh, and we're still at the point of uh, deciding the exact nature of the foundations, about 40% of the structure will be built in Gibraltar, uh, and then the, 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 the actual content of the building will be delivered, as it were, and slaughtered into place. But we need to bring in experts from outside, and it's very difficult at the moment to get anybody to travel. We're doing a lot of things online. Uh, we're in contact with our suppliers, sending them things. They've got to send them back to us. We are having to check everything uh, to make sure that it is meeting British standards, that the, that the quality of the stuff that we're buying is what we need. So, in fact, we're doing everything that can be done, hampered by what is taking place that is affecting the economy negatively and the movement of goods and people negatively. That means that the ambitious target that I had of May is now going to be delayed and it will probably be closer to the end of the year rather than this summer that it should be completed. Okay, can I just ask one more question about your current predictions for recovery and subsequently growth? What are your thoughts on that? Look. As far as the National Economic Plan, which is the vehicle, the engine, that will deliver uh, economic growth, uh, what I've already said in Parliament, and I'm still sticking to that, is that the amount of growth it will generate has not been affected by anything that has happened. But it will grow from a lower base. That is to say, if we had an economy that was producing uh, uh, an output valued at two and a half billion, and I expect an additional half a billion to be added over the life cycle of the, of the program, so that it would go from two and a half to three. If the economy now is at two instead of two and a half, then I would expect it to go from two to two and a half. So, so the impact is the half a million half a million on top of what that is there when it starts. I expected that what was there when it started would be two and a half million, but it's gonna, not going to be two and a half million anymore because uh, that figure was the figure that we had projected for the year ending in March last year. And then in February, we had the impact of the beginning of the pandemic. And in between, we've had the, uh, you know, the uncertainties about the nature of the relationship at the end of the transition period, which still has some effect in the sense that in terms of inward investment, which is part of my portfolio as well, people who are investing in Gibraltar uh, would be more or less attracted depending on the nature of their business and on the nature of our relationship in terms of what is happening between us and the UK, us and the EU, and us and all the other countries 
that are now signing trade agreements with UK in which we are included. So the UK is constantly doing new trade deals and we are being included as part of the UK in those trade deals. I appreciate it's very difficult to give a, a timeline, but you've talked about government expenditure exceeding uh, government revenue. When do you think we'll start to see some recovery? Look, I can't tell you that because at the moment, at this very moment as we are talking, the position is that the costs are still going up and the income is still going down. And I, I don't know, you know, uh, these are lines that are moving in divergent uh, 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 directions, away from each other. At some point, they will stop going away from each other and start back and come together again. Since they're still going away from each other, it means the gap is still increasing. It's impossible for me to tell you when, it, when it's going to start declining, let alone when it will stop. But I can tell you one thing that I have already said publicly, and I said it in the last intervention in Parliament, the level of revenue of the government, which was £706 million in 1819, uh, we will not see again this side of the next general election.